Okay. Um, questions. Okay. So, um, one of the questions I had too is because I've never, I, one of the things I struggled with in, in grad school, I guess I'm, this context first, but is I couldn't find a, the best way to organize my thoughts because I like mess. I kind of like, I kind of like just writing and being chaotic and, and I just couldn't get a system. And so what I realized is like, I should have just been writing on paper this whole time. Like my, my brain flows when there's no, there's no binding, there's no, there's, there's no like color coding. It just, I just need paper and a pen. What is that? Is that an EMTP thing or is that, um, I just feel like the, that platform is less restricting. Like the computer's restricting in some ways. So that pen and paper. <coughs> well, I feel like, I feel like I want to lay my thoughts on top of one another sometimes. Like I'm building clusters of thoughts. And there's I no way to do that. pen and paper for a number of reasons. Um, because it gives you, it gives you the capacity to have things that have their own in, individual distinct geography to them. Each page is memorable because it's got different little doodles and different little shit on it, you know. And, uh, and it helps your SI. I think it's an SI benefiter more than it is even an any benefiter. Granted, there's plenty of times when I find myself wanting to diagram some concept out, try to do it on the computer, give up, and maybe sketch it out on paper more successfully, you know. <coughs> but <coughs> the other thing that made me think of is uh Organizing stuff, organizing from another perspective, which is, I've always been frustrated because I always have wanted to feel as though I've metaphysically climbed to the highest vantage point to look down on everything, so I can yeah. get a general grasp of where everything lies in relation to everything else, but That's I can so never annoying. find <laughs> the highest vantage point, right? You can never get to that vantage point exactly. You can get as high up as you can get, but as soon as you start to try to get a handle on the scope of the things you're looking at, you realize like, well, each of these each of these um, is understood through multiple frames of reference and the frames of reference start to get overwhelmingly many when you just add in a few different vectors, to, to the bigger the picture, the more impossible to understand. And then you get, it's like, I got to get to the right spot where I can just see everything and get the overall picture. And then I'll finally understand everything, you know? Yeah, that was, that was a big problem. That's a big problem I've always had, but especially grad school, they want to see that you just did, they just, you know, one, one paper, one, whatever. Um, the one assignment, I I went. I don't understand enough, and my brain would convince me. I say my brain, but it's me. Like I am my brain. I would convince myself that it's okay. I can just learn up until the deadline, and then you can pump out a paper fast. You're smart. I turned in a lot of stuff late, and it was it was frustrating because you know in in classes your professors would uh would appreciate the the dialogue you would bring and the knowledge you'd bring, but they would not appreciate not the, the non-submissions or late submissions. What, and so field, what it made, field of, of biology you said, right? Uh, animal. So my background was, um, I grew up on a fish farm, and so my background was in uh, aquaculture or and fish biology. And, uh, and then I went to UC Davis. I was on a project, uh, yeah. And uh, it was in the animal biology PhD program. So I was working with um, stem cells, or sorry, germline trans transplantation, or essentially you could think like gonad transplantation in fish. Mm. And, uh, and I ran into some issues with the research team there. And, and so I could, I still have the option of just finishing out with a master. 
and so that was a, that was a messy experience where um, that that affected me pretty negatively mentally. But now it's I can see the blessing a little bit because the more I reflect upon grad school, the more I can see that it was a very um, isolating experience for somebody like myself. Maybe, maybe another another uh, like less more 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 creative based path would have been healthier. But I ultimately, um, the kind of neurotic um, need to push research by, like, it's, it always felt like, like a centimeter or a millimeter or a plank or a parsec, you know, but just whatever unit, they just want to, if this is, if this is where the field is at, they just want to put, they tell you to push it this far and you go, wait, I've done all this incredible thinking. And if we, you know, if we invest some resources we can push it that far and uh and so every step of the way you there's pushback and and i understand the science the the need for in science for them to for your like pi or your advisor or your committee to push back in terms of finding um finding i guess like scientifically valid research statistically relevant research uh conclusions that they can publish on but it just felt like the need to publish is it was the the ultimate end-all be-all um and it just felt a little bit gross and a lot of the personalities i just didn't mesh with and um i could see a path towards me uh like i could see myself running like a a, a lab someday if i was to stay in academics and do well for a really long time but um I feel like ENTPs are often well suited to jobs in which they would be, I wouldn't say directing a lot of people, but they're kind of driving some sort of creative process. But you, there's no, in almost every job, you have to go through, you know, many layers of kind of neurotic, you know, tedious work with people that are, that are hampering your, your most innate skill. And so that's something I'm trying to come to terms with. And right now I'm just, yeah, at a stage where I can finish my master's or, or move on. It's very pliable. Hmm. But, uh, yeah, I don't, ultimately, it's not, it's not my passion anymore. And, and I, uh, you know, I told my mom, I just want to dance. But uh, I, I don't want to just dance. I want to, that's not even, I don't dance well. Okay. I, uh, what, what's your next question? That was a good ramble, though. It's un unavoidable. It's, it's fine. There's no FE critique in, implicit in my moving along to the next question. Okay. Understood. Um, so, I guess actually to build off of what I was saying, is is there a way to, to like, maximize the utility of, of somebody that is kind of just... Uh, you know, an idea generator. You know, they're 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 hyper creative. Um, it seems like ENTPs would be well suited to something where the task is constantly changing, or there's um, there's a high level of adaptability required. I, I don't know if you've thought about this or yeah, is that something sure. that's been pertinent on my own? Um, so I I happen to be. A fortunate ENTP in that I fell into kind of textbook ENTP job. You've coached before. You understand that there's something satisfying about coaching. That mm -hmm. it's uh, a pretty good gig um, because, in large part, uh, being smart and being motivational with FE are two big elements of coaching. But those are maximally attained when you're coaching debate. So, uh, oh. I, co I coach competition flow debate, and that's like the textbook job for an HP. But it's an even better job for an HP because I had a lot of years there where I had some big squads and and uh, you know went to a lot of tournaments, we won a lot of trophies and that kind of stuff, right? But what's an even better job for an HP is YouTuber. YouTuber is the best job for an HP. 
you've got lots of shit to say. Um, and you need to say it. And you need to be publicly heard saying it. And additionally, you'll find that, first of all, you're a lot more natively pleasant in your current form than I was when I... I don't know if you're currently YouTube or not, but... 26. But, uh... But when I, when I started YouTubing, I was very uh, confrontational, divisive, uh, off-putting, insufferable, and I've gotten decreasingly That's so on all of those vectors the longer I've done it, because what will happen is if you persist at it, if you find it just comfortable to be able to have a form in which you can speak out all your thoughts and know that they at least have possibly somebody looking at them, Maybe one or two people at first, you know. If you persist at it, though, um, you'll develop a, a community of people who provide basically a buffer between you and the most serious risks of FI Polar. The most serious risks of FI Polar are the ones you just incurred. Um, namely, being in a, an abusive relationship and isolated sufficiently from the group that your FE was being controlled by a single person. Yeah, I mean, I've never really had much of a group, to be honest. I've never really, I wouldn't say I've been a lone wolf. I've just been a. It's it's hard to make like deeper connections sometimes. You're you're, you're a That's fun place. Because you don't want a group of deep connections. Hmm. You want a large group of shallow connections. Not really. I haven't really had much of that either. I, I, I believe you think that. I would have said exactly the same thing before I started doing YouTube. I had no idea how badly I needed a community of people to provide me a solid data regarding FE um, and how valuable it was. How valuable the genuine affirmation and appreciation of people for, for saying things that I'm saying, whatever, and they send you, they write some sort of comment saying, oh shit, you really impacted my life and moved me and whatever, all that stuff. It doesn't sound like much in the abstract to you, but is in reality, it's among the more gratifying things that I could have ever imagined experiencing. And when I realized, oh shit, you know, I really thrive with attention. I, I, I would have always denied wanting or seeking attention because, of course, who wants to think of themselves as somebody who's an attention seeker? Nobody. Yeah. It's it's a conundrum because I I definitely like I've never really understood the 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 kind of more narcissistic side of social media where people are trying to put out this like this kind of um, image of themselves that's going to be the most approved. Uh, I like putting out the image of myself that is whatever I want to say because I have ultimately at this point in my life I don't have much shame. You're, I'll say you whatever. You're underselling Effie. You're you are reductively addressing, you know, narcissistic meh, and you are basically treating what is, is a nuanced engagement with a mass number of people's uh, perceptions of you in an intuitive way that is mutually beneficial. And you're saying, yeah. I don't want to fake what I am. No, 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 no. Um... I, I don't say is. anything. I don't say anything that I have not always said. I just say it differently. Um, I don't mean that. I so I, I didn't. I guess I didn't finish. Um, I I kind of got lost in thought. But uh, I I, I've never. Off. It's okay. I but I never understood people that that. But there's never any quality or content, and you never see the organic them, and they're following a formula. And that's one thing that that my ex and me would point out is we we would feel like we'd see like you know a group of you know whatever uh, let's say like sorority sorority girls right they're all wearing the same thing and it's like oh they all just like downloaded a personality they're all the same person they're all trying to be whatever right and and I've never understood when people are trying to all portray this similar thing it's like we're all these kind of beautiful unique creatures and we should be saying beautiful and unique things to beautiful and unique people. And so you're you're probably right, and and frankly, I I've been called, I've been I've been asked before if I'm narcissistic or you know self loving and stuff. It's like no, I just need, don't know what people think of me, and that's why I'm asking because otherwise I would I would know it, but I don't know it. So I'm I'm uh, I'm lower confidence than you might think. 
But I mean, so that's, I, that's what YouTube fixes. Okay, so they feed the ego. I need it, that. It's not just feeding the ego. <laughs> See, it's so productive, right? Look, yeah. the fact I, is, I grew up. Hey, I grew up in a town that was real small, and uh, and so yeah, I just the big city story. <laughs> what can I say? It, it is not feeding the ego. It's outsourcing management of the ego to superior wisdom, which is to say this: we default to um, our individuality as our go-to FE weapon, as you've gone to on a few t few occasions here. Look, I say I'm not gonna mean. I'm just gonna be okay. You know, you're gonna have to put up with what the truth. I'm not gonna mean. Um, that's our go-to default weapon. So what I'm saying is, it turns out, as you may or may not have encountered in the past, that that doesn't necessarily play well. Uh, the thing is, there's a lot of people out there who, though, both respect the logic of what we're saying and the validity of what we're saying and the insight that we're providing and really would like to see us and our voices be more successfully manifest and those people will um, in ways both nice and mean uh, teach in EHP lessons about about how to incorporate genuine respect for for conflicting modalities while maintaining a fundamentally uh, superior meta frame as we perceive it because uh, it probably is yeah um, that's actually something I've thought of I, I know I'm being resistant to the idea of of going on online but th these are these are thoughts I've been playing with is just like maybe I should put out some videos and uh, and I've even thought about different ideas that would be unique. Like I, I really like Bill Burr's style, for example, of just when he does get going on a rant, he has this one. I, I really follow a lot of, of comics too, um, but I don't think stand-up comedy is going to come back the same way following COVID. But uh, um, and I like improv, and I like there, there's a lot of like of kind of uh, ways to express yourself in, in this medium. But I like so with the Bill Burr thing, just like. I can transition into into ranting, um, and so I could have things where I sound more wholesome, and and you're having a conversation with another person, and you could have ones where you're just fucking screaming at the at the computer, and uh, you know some people might find that interesting if you're saying funny funny off the wall shit, and um, and uh, if if you think it is a good idea because it's something where where I bounce that idea off a few people, and they're like you almost have your masters, I. I not passionate about it at all. Um, but here's the thing. My guess is you probably watched a couple of my videos that you have very little further uh, knowledge mm -hmm. about the channel. Correct. Before immediately contacting me and wanting to talk to me, right? I'm impulsive, yes. Yeah. So the thing is, I actually have 5,300 videos. Mm -hmm. I've and what that means is, when I started, I said, just sort of as a joke, well, maybe I'll just try to see if I can make as big a pile as possible of videos about every possible topic I can think of and see what happens, you know? Um, the thing is, strategically, it's not a good strategy. But in terms of self management, strategically, it's a very good strategy because it just says, oh, I'll just upload any video I want about any little thought I have. As soon as it comes to me, I just record it, upload it, and call it a video. And you will get accused of, you know, spamming your subs with too many uploads or whatever. Um, but the thing is, you learn a lot in that process. You learn to not care, number one. This video is a dead. Who the fuck cares? Did somebody say that? I mean, you'll. I mean, you'll know. You'll know. <laughs> you, you'll know by the, as you start to get stats and stuff, you'll recognize this video. You'll start to learn a bunch of shit. You know, it's like I, I've made videos before that I think are airtight, good TI arguments about shit, and I rewatch it and I realize it's boring as fuck. The only people who are gonna watch this are ENTPs, and that's it. ENTPs don't even watch this. And then I've made other videos that are very carefully edited and have done poorly. I made very uh, edited uh, videos that are improv and done really well and vice versa and 
and you start to see like okay occasionally I do some plan shit like I have this video called Don Adams a sad ending and I copied somebody else's title except I replaced a celebrity I made it about five minutes long I copied the format of it and uh, and I said okay let's see if this has legs and sure enough month after month it gets about 500 views steady earner you know it's like if I if all my 50 or 300 videos were like that I'd be making bank right but most of them don't have any legs so you learn what kind of videos have legs what kind of videos don't like for me cognitive functions turned out to be an evergreen topic that uh, I made typically got more views than my other topics but I still can't stay on topic I still mostly live stream yeah um yeah, no, I, I think I think that's a good idea. Just going out there with with several different ideas, um, and and just picking around. I, I mean, I, I really want to imbue mine with with some semblance of comedy or, or quirkiness or, or just being ridiculous. Um, I think some people that I watch that do a great job of that in podcasts are like, for example, I mean, he's a more major comedian, but like Theo Vaughn does a really good job of that. Um, I think uh, Bobby Lee does a really good job of that, and I think. People, especially during quarantine, are, are missing having, you know, a lot of conversations. And so by just pot, like podcasting, like listening to people, it makes them feel not so lonely. Um, and I guess for us, not so lonely because we need to talk and people need to listen. So uh, actually, you're, you're, I was thinking of the first video of yours I saw, which is you had some like, nin you're, you're, I don't know, I don't think you actually had ninja swords, but you were talking about... Um, how this one person annoyed you, and uh, and that you were gonna like lay it on her, and then you decided to to not do that, right? Yeah. Because they're so sensitive. I don't know if you remember the particular video, but in that one, you you made me laugh. That's why I watch more videos. Hmm. And so, I think I think, uh, or like similar to George George Carlin, you can use kind of some mechanism of of ranting and comedy and sense to to kind of help people not even help people i i wouldn't even pretend to say that i'm helping people i'm helping myself but if if they gain something from it good for them but to help uh that's, that's help entertain true. people i want to entertain people it's i mean that's the skill i have and i can't right. i'm not gonna sing it yeah yeah and the thing is oh here's the deal um I, I provide uh, an excellent both example and negative example. So you can avoid the kind of mistakes I made. Almost everybody who started doing YouTubing, especially if they do typology stuff, but you don't, don't feel like you got to do typology stuff or whatever, but no. almost everybody who started it after me has zoomed right past me. So it's like um, you're younger, you have more going for you in that regard uh, in terms of identifying with the demographic audience that is largely comprised of YouTube, you know. And um, if, you know, you get your, your humor stuff down, it can be highly effective as Frank James has learned is his humor stuff is very effective. Frank um, James? Yeah, I've got a humor playlist as well. Um, I'm looking You've got to get on that TikTok. Yeah. Looking for something specific. Uh, Share those videos on Bumble. Let's see. Uh, Don't go on Bumble. That's crap. What's it called? If there's any female listeners, it's because y'all don't take any chances. Uh, Bumble's terrible because just no, but nothing ever happens. Ever. I'm looking for something right now, which is why I'm slightly distracted. No, it's okay. Um, so, the, uh, the thing is, I have a lot of different things on my channel. I've got comedy stuff. I've got, um, I've got a lot of songs, too. You know, I, uh, I have hundreds of songs that I've put up here, music videos I, and such. But, um... I do you make your own lyrics and you like hear a song and you just start, you start just, you know, I, I like to do that with my dog. Um, I just like add his name and all the lyrics. I just make every lyric Toby. Uh, uh, I, mean, 
I, I I do all kinds of different stuff with I with lyrics and stuff. I I I try to be a serious songwriter. Um, and sometimes I've been just fucking around. You know, I've got I've got a song about COVID. <laughs> you know, I got the COVID. And uh, so you know, I've I've um, made. A video like this before, um, which I'll just in, as you endure a minute or two of uh, before uh, you get the gist of what sort of thing Lionel is. Sprinting Wolf Kazakuo was merely Lionel Kazakuo, recent high school graduate. Jobless, penniless, prospectless, and with no skills beyond his own intuitive godlike wisdom, Lionel Kazakuo set about to change the world. Talking, talking with famous people. Hello, my name is Dr. Lionel Sprinting Wolf Casico, and I am a life coach and a Native American. Yes, part Native American, a small part. Dr. Casico went and got himself a doctorate. He found a school to issue him one without requiring him to do any work. Are you really saying I want to sprint like the wolf? Yes, you're saying that. This was merely the first of a series of miracles that Dr. Kazakuo would perform, proving, in fact, that he has that magical metaphysical power that everybody's totally looking for. I, Dr. Lionel Sprinting Wolf Kazakuo, Native American. When I first came here, I didn't know whether I wanted to be a surgeon, an architect, or a veterinarian, or what. Yes, I will coach you. And your life. He said to me, Mary, you're a, you're a crawling cub. And I said, I am, aren't I? And he said, yeah, you are. This is not an offer that's going to last long. So you get the gist of it, you know. I, I've made a couple of videos like that. Um, you're muted right now. I'm back. But, uh, so I, I do the same thing where I like, I like have characters I've just kind of developed over time where I, I kind of, you know, some of them I, I might maybe want to check and make sure I don't get, you know, like canceled before I, before I even got my, my you know, feet off the ground because, you know, if there's some sort of, like, ethnic influence in the voice, then, you know, you're this, or that was not... Um, I was also thinking about doing a show called Uncancelable. Um, I'm not sure how I'd work around it, but, you know, that seems to be all the rage is people getting canceled and talking about canceling, and, you know, if you can find a way to be... Because I'm defiant. That's my, my innate nature is I just, like, I don't really care. Like, if people, like, are not okay with it, it's like, okay... <laughs> so it's uh, I I, I kind of learn that I kind of don't mind people. I, I like I don't mind I mind people close to me critiquing me. I don't mind as much people that aren't close to me critiquing me. And so maybe maybe something that's really edgy. But uh, you, can, you, know, you know what? Maybe we could collaborate on Mindy's Club. I made one episode of it, and I'd like to make a second episode. I kind of stalled out on it. It's only like three minutes long. You want to check it out and see if maybe you're interested in collaborating? Mindy's Club. Yeah, no. Let me show it to you. All right. Mindy's Club. Oh, I was going to say, the one other thing I like to do, and I've been really bad about it, because sometimes the best things I say are when I've, I'm like just a few beers deep or, you know, maybe that's... I, I get pretty messed up easy on weed, and I'll just have these weird quotes, and I'll have... I'll have... I want to make like a whole story around just a quote that's that's so silly you know like um what's the one i had here what if all religions were made by sad cavemen just as an example and then you just I mean, go the whole it, video around it doesn't just work as a as a story center it could also work as a nice piece of dialogue you know yeah yeah so i think just taking something outlandish and just like wrapping Rapping, you know, you, you can generate a lot. We we good at moving our mouths and filling up a clock. So let me see here. Share YouTube. 
So this is the one and only episode of Manny's Club. I have pictures for other episodes I'm putting them together. Oops. Freshman year of college, exactly like high school as in the movies. How are we gonna do that? Quack. When high school in the movies seems mean. Exactly. Carly. What? What are you doing over there? Just resting. Quack. Where are Tiffany's clothes? My name is Tiffany with an I. Quack. Yeah, where are your clothes, Tiffany? I, I'm not sure. Somebody drove me off here like this. Bork! Oh my god, Tiffany, you're such a slut. It's Tiffany with an eye. Oh my god, Tiffany with an eye, you're such a slut. Bork! Okay, so here's the plan. Duck girl is different. That means we need to bully her. Bork! Quack. How am I going to do that? Good question, Tiffany with an eye. Quack. Why do I have to get bullied? Quack. Does anybody want anything from Starbucks? Because you're a duck girl and you're different. But listen, here's the good news. You're also going to get to be the different kid who gets redeemed by the popular girls. We're going to bully you and then we're going to redeem you. Quack. Can't we just skip the bullying and go straight to the redemption? No. That would not be like the movies. This is the Mindy Club, damn it! And this is my dream. And you're all on board, right? We're blood sisters. We swore to it last night when we were all drunk. Quack. Burp. Oh my god, does that mean we're related now? Too many god. Listen, do you want something from Starbucks? I'm getting fraps. Burp. Quack. Can't we bully Boxy instead? Burp. Now here's the plan. At the busiest time. You're going to walk down that quad like you don't suspect anything. Meanwhile, Tiffany's going to be up in the tree, the big tree that overlooks the quad. And as soon as you walk underneath there, she's going to pour a bucket of blood on your head. Will I get dirty up in the tree? Now you put some clothes on, Tiffany. I don't have any clothes right now. Tiffany, you're such a slut. Quack. Tiffany is a slut. Quack. Burk. You are kind of a slut, Tiff. It's Tiffany with an eye. Okay, so let's play. Quack. Mr. Newsome, I need some advice. Quack. Well, Duck Girl, what do you think the old university janitor is for? I give advice, I speak for landmines, and I clean up vomit. That's mostly what I do right here, but I like the first part best. So you go ahead and tell, tell old Mr. Newsome what's giving you problem. I joined the Mindy Club to be popular, quack. But now they want to bully me and then redeem me, quack. Oh, I see. That is a troublesome conundrum. Well, have you thought about walking under the tree with an umbrella? Quack, how do you know about the train, quack? Oops. I, I like it. I think... I think if you change the, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to come right in with critique. That's I don't. Fine. That's fine. Okay. I think if you do like, if it's, if it's more of like an imagery thing too. It's like, you can make something look so so stellar just by changing the scope. Like I'm going to flip this thing around and just show you the mess that is my desk right now. Right. And so if I just showed you that, it's like, top. But then if I come in close. With just this pen, right? And I get real close. You start the details. If I can get it just right, we'll start to like really pop. Right now, there's no perspective. Ah. So you think the pictures aren't close enough? Yeah, like I, I, I actually was trying to show you that, and I never got it because my hands were so shaky because I got crackhead energy. But um, like uh, like um. Like slowing it down, I think a little bit, and then, and then, uh, yeah, like slow, like changing the imagery to slowing it down. Things are like really close in frame, um, and then I think like a little bit more, just like vocal clarity on the, on the. Um, I agree. The audio is kind of fucked up. Um, I, you know, it's always a question of um, of how much 
polish versus it's not versus how much uh, effort. Yeah, and time and energy and, and various things. Uh, Let me see if I can pull up some images on my computer, and I'll just kind of I don't know. Like I'm probably being redundant on the point. Uh, the point you... I get you. I get your point. Uh, the oh. thing is, um, uh, you know, I don't. I don't know if it's possible for two HTTPs to collaborate, but it would be interesting. I was curious to see what you'd do if I were to send you all the uh, all the various Mindy pictures and little clips of video I have. Like for example, Mindy and the gang went to Hawaii, and. Mm -hmm. uh, Foxy got lost at sea. <laughs> Poor Foxy fell off into the ocean and got washed out to, to sea. And uh, Mindy has a rival there, and Mindy uh, pushes her off of a cliff at the mm -hmm. end of the episode. Now, I, that's the general story that's sort of presented by the images, I guess you could say. Uh, mm -hmm. A fair number of images, but... Uh, uh, it'd be curious to see if you uh, what you do is that if you were to just have the images and uh, and show me how it's done because I mean I don't is, know like if you send it to me I can like play around and send you something back um, but I don't I don't even know if that's something I can or can't do I've never even tried anything remotely like that but hmm. I'd be curious all right well I'll send you the images um, I have to put it together probably tomorrow or something too. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think. Look, look through your questions and throw out a few questions in a row, uh, and just so I can hear what they are. Okay. All right. I'll I'll go. You know, between the two hundreds and the three hundreds, at the three hundreds and four hundreds. But I I guess the the one other thing too is is people like like if you're ENTP or expressive, that's what people like is they like to see your faces lighting up and you're drawing their attention and you're captivating and and I think like the greatest skill you have is. Or not skill, but like perhaps asset is is your mouth and what comes out of it, and then your face. You're like really animated, and they, you know. Well, it uh, does comprise ninety nine percent of my content. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and I think for something that's like, if you, if it is like uh, directed towards growing, maybe like, um, I it, it sucks because it does feel like a sellout of uh, what your it's not your channel is really. Huh? You know, it's that these things aren't purposed, really. They're uh, creative impulses that I follow through on. No, no, absolutely. I, I like that about your channel. I like that a lot. And um, and then I think you, there's ways to, like, do that and then also throw in some things that are, like, targeted towards, um, like, just de demographic or, or, you know, like, a, a particular audience and just, like, what type of people can you drag in to just... Because, like, I'm... I'm very fascinated to hear what you're going to say, and I know that you have followers that are very fascinated to hear what you're going to say. And so, how do you find more of those people? You know, it's maybe it's something that's kind of directed. It's like satirical or ridiculous, but um, putting like a lot of effort into like a short video might have really you're good. Not fascinated. <laughs> what? What? When I listen to your other videos of you talking, listen, that's I why mean, we're talking. This, now. That's what I mean by you're not fascinated. Um, ENTPs ultimately glean large amounts of information from small amounts of data in very quick order and then move on to probably doing their own shit, you know? Uh, it's, uh... Is this not just the abandonment complex here? No, 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 this is, this is my appreciation of my type. Look. I understand that we're both hunters ultimately, and uh, and here here you're functioning as um, an audience member, you know. Mm -hmm. But immediately, immediately after functioning as an audience member, you successfully contact me to communicate with you directly and make videos. So I'd point out that uh, it's it's in your nature, you know. Mm -hmm. I think, though, if I was a hunter, I definitely got, like, killed in the woods. They're like, let's just, like, he died on the hunt. You know, the lion got him this time. Um, so I, I think I didn't make it to adulthood, but... Yeah, hey, um, I still haven't made it there yet, either. 
You just got to keep on doing as as you are, you know? Is this why ENTPs, like, I don't know if you feel this way, but I've never had a problem with getting older. I've always wanted to get older because with age comes wisdom. I mean, there's a certain wisdom point. Comes... There was a certain moment when I realized, okay, I have the a demographic point. advantage now. It's not, it's not purely an advantage, but I am able to be taken more seriously by young people than other young people in general um, about certain subjects. So that that uh, was nice to realize that um, okay, I can position, I can play the experience card to some extent on some occasions with some types. Sometimes people don't respond to the experience card, but you know, um, and also it's the thing is we spend our whole lives always developing skills and never thinking it's time to use them. And so, uh, eventually, your skills to, that you've been developing get pretty damn good, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. And it becomes inevitable that you start using them more effectively. Obviously, I'm still just as hit and miss that as I've ever been, you know. And that just goes without, goes with the territory. However, I would say that my misses now are less dramatically missy and my hits now are more consistent if not necessarily more power uh so that's progress yeah no it is i i don't i don't know if you relate to it or not but uh probably but um i uh i'm not afraid of failure because i've i've failed and fallen on my face a few times really hard and and uh it still hurts, you know, it's still hard to get up every time. And at some point you want to stop kind of falling flat on your face. And, uh, and so that does resonate just, uh, you know, um, not, not, uh, you know, like it seems like you, you know, as an ETP or you're, you're going to, um, blossom later than other people, but yeah, it just feels like, you're in everyone's eyes you're this potential and in your own eyes too because everyone's told you this your whole life that, that you're intelligent and you have this potential you're, you're very bright you're very creative you're this you're that right um but uh but it's never you're worked. underachieving yeah yeah but uh it's like tragically underachieving you you start the projects and you're going good and then you you sabotage yourself and so but I can talk for a, I can talk for a while if that's if that's all that's required. Like I can do that. The self sabotage over time, I think, it's fair to say, becomes less uh, less obviously that maybe. I'm not sure it stops, but it's becomes more integrated into your overall self-concept maybe and less obviously self-sabotage and more an expression of your authenticity or something yeah well, or maybe it, that's just how you bullshit yourself all, all the above hey, um, this sounds like an appealing pile of bullshit I'm totally yeah. buying this bullshit hey I'm loving this excuse this is hey, working I, great I've always been offended by this particular quote because... Uh, sorry, I couldn't hear you. Let me get my headphones back on. Okay. Um, I, uh, I've i always been particularly... A, I would say, like, offended or, like, this, not a triggered, I don't know, by this quote, and it's uh, those who can't do teach. And I, and I don't... I know that, like, in some capacity that's true for me because it's, like... I, I can conceptually get things very well and talk about them and apply it and it's you know I, l lately I've been thinking more if that's all if I if I just work on skills that I'm ill performed to perform or that I'm uh, I, I, I don't know like that maybe I just shouldn't be doing I, I lack the words but uh then then you're gonna end up in that kind of like supplementary role and you're I think as a you're kind of doomed to be taken advantage of. And it's like, uh, what, what inherently is the skills that you bring to the table? And it's, it's creativity. It's, um, it's, it's adaptability. And how do you monetize that? Or how do you find value in that? And, 
Um, you know, Co- been- coaching is different than teaching. And if you're coaching the right thing and you're in a special specialized enough field, it can be rather lucrative. So now I, I, you probably don't have competition debate experience, but um, which is a normal prerequisite. But there's nothing precluding you from successfully coaching competition flow debate once you learn a few basics. You know, you've got the right kind of of head for it. And yeah. if you get good at it, that is a lot more lucrative than other kinds of teaching because you get rich parents who want, if, if you're a good coach, of course. See, that's the thing. It's like coaches and athletes are the only two things that are irreplaceable. Every other employee is replaceable. Coaches and athletes are not. <laughs> like, you can't replace Nick Saban and say, okay, we'll just get another coach, whatever, it's fine. No, not going to work. Like USC replacing Pete Carroll. That did not work. Shit went downhill. You can't replace the best, you know? Oh. So. Um, yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, I, I just think that's... For a second, I get my coffee. I'll be right back. Stretch those bones. Um, so what if what if what did I write this what if religion was started by sad cavemen that's my question for you that's a refreshing coffee it's a refreshing coffee. It's the cappuccino. The key to um, coffee is uh, a lot, a lot, a lot of non-dairy creamer. The powdered kind. Yeah. I gotta get the lactate pills, because I, I go hard on half and half. Ooh, see, replace it. The thing is, don't be misled. You're gonna use powdered creamer. You're always gonna put in too little powdered creamer. You're gonna think this is shitty. If you put in a shit ton of powdered creamer... It's the best cup of coffee you'll ever have. You just gotta like just pour, 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 pour. pour. It'll all melt into the coffee, and you will have this delicious frothy brew like I have right here. See the frothiness of this brew? You know what I call that? That's like a redneck cappuccino, man. <laughs> this, is, this is the only way I drink coffee anymore. It's so good. It's so it's so much more meaty and creamy than an actual milk or cream. Mm, meat. And you can see my self-cleaning mug here as well. Make sure that, yeah, self-cleaning mug. I never have to clean it. It maintains these. These 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 markings are actually intentional folk art that's been put onto my mug by Native Americans. That's why it looks are you like native? this. Um, well, I'm transracial, fluidly transracial. So, as in you, you exhibit whatever you, you exhibit the race that you that you identify as. It means that on any given day, I may wake up. Depends which race. It's hard to tell. Sometimes I don't even know until the middle of the day that I've changed race. Uh, the only one that really consistently lets me know what race I am is if, when I do turn Chinese. I get karate. It comes with it. Um, other than that. The races are pretty much, it's like hard to tell. But, you know, I can tell when I'm African American because I have this weird habit of sometimes saying my people, which I don't really ever say in any other context. Um, let my let my people go. That's, that's. I, I prefer to, I want to help my pe- people. I'm like, wait, wait, who am I talking about? I get confused. Um, and then also, of course, when I'm Mexican, I, uh, I do find myself. Uh, strangely attracted to sombreros. Uh, that's not a, Latinos. N- n- well, yeah, no, I mean, as a Latino male, I find myself mostly attracted to white girls. Mm-hmm. Um, but so you're a Californian. I, well, I live in Tijuana, but I cross the border frequently. Mm-hmm. When I'm Mexican, you see, fl- being fluidly transracial doesn't just mean changing race, it means when you change race, you become a resident of that place briefly. So when I become Guamanese, 
I'm briefly a resident of Guam. Hmm. I bet you didn't even know Guamanese was a race. It's a specific islander, right? Guamanese no, no specific. there's a lot more races than you think. Do you know the French Canadians are a race? More, more than 10. Well, yeah, they're, they're the Acadian people. They're, they're, and then what's really fascinating is those are the same people that that, uh, that um, started the, I guess, like, the early Cajun people, or early Cajun, and then some of the influence into Creole. And so that's, like, one of the most fascinating cultures on the planet because it's such a hodgepodge of, of weirdness and how it occurred. And so uh, the food there, if you go to New Orleans will fuck you up. It's I, so I've good. been there, yeah, I've been to New Orleans. Before yeah. the flood. And um, Baton Rouge. I've been to Baton Rouge as well. My I have relatives who live in Baton Rouge. Um so you may not know this. Texans are their own race. Well yeah, they're just they're Texans. They're Texans, yeah. I've been Texan before. Um, I was surprised yes. to discover that, in fact, everything was bigger. I felt tiny in comparison to everything, all of a sudden. It was strange. I was only texting briefly. You're in New Orleans. Or, no, sorry. But you're in, uh, you're in, uh, L.A., right? Los LA Angeles, area? California, yeah. Yeah. I've never been a fan, to be honest. I'm from the Central Valley, so closer to Sacramento. And when I go down there, so I'm from a really small town. I grew up on a fish farm. And... <laughs> And when I would go to the first time, like big cities scared me as a kid. And so when I go to L when I went to LA for the first time, I went, the city never ends. You just like look in the distance. There's no cows. There's no farmland. It was just road and city and building. And well, people. I like to say, Samuel, that Los Angeles is the biggest and best mediocre city in the world. It's more mediocre by the day I hear. Yeah. That's what everyone's saying. It, it'll come back. Listen, hey. They're not sucking enough water from it's us. It's not oh. too late to save things, and I am running for president in 2024. Uh, okay, what's the what's that one guy that had the boot? We we should get him as a get him on board too. Whatever happened to him? He ran every year. Who? Or every presidential cycle. There was this one guy that would ran, and he had like a boot on his head. Okay, well, see, I'm not actually a joke candidate. I'm a serious candidate. Actually, I actually have a platform. I have a large and well-established political agenda. I'm actually the most qualified person in the country to be president, and uh, what's what, what's your party? I'm I'm actually I have a very particular stance on abortion, and I have, and I'm also also I'm pro life, so pro life and pro choice. I'm actually pro death. I just want everyone to die, because everyone's intolerable, um, and that's the camp campaign I'm going to run on, and then I could be a running mate. No, you're not going to be a running mate. I have a serious platform. Um, oh. yeah. all right. Like I have it or to I'm gonna come to all your I'm gonna come to all your ra rallies and I'm gonna like yeah he's pro death you're gonna have to refute it and you can't refute it why can't I refute that I'm pro death because I'm very convincing I'm gonna be a cult leader well what's my position on abortion <sighs> um I don't know if that's a serious question I don't know what your yeah it's a serious question what do you think my abortion I, I think you're you're probably personally pro-choice. If it was your child, you would want to have it, but you would respect if the partner didn't want to have it, and you you would probably defer to them. But for, for other people, um, you're pro-choice. I would think you're pro-life personally, pro-choice societally. My position on it is that the current justification for abortion is illogical. There is no right to privacy. Is justified in the Vice Supreme Court according to a right for, to privacy. So that regardless of whatever else we do, we need to make sure that our position on abortion is consistent. It's either property or it's not property, one of those two things. If it is property, then a woman needs to consult and get the approval of a man, provided that the baby or fetus or whatever you want to call it was consensually created. In the case of the rape, of course, there would not be a requirement of the uh, co-property creator to, uh, to abort. Now, if we were to decide, in fact, that it's not property, well, then, of course, then it's an entity with rights, and we, the abortion would be uh, prohibited. My position on it is, number one, we need to remove it from federal domain because, of course, the Supreme Court's justification holds no water whatsoever, since right, since privacy obviously can't be a right, and leave it to the states.
Well, let's talk about property. It sounds very libertarian. I, I'm not um, saying it's property. I know, I know. I'm, um, saying, I'm, saying, I'm saying go ahead and make the argument that it's not property. That's fine, too. Pick one. I don't care. Yeah, yeah. If it's part, if it's part of your body and it's attached to you, like my my pinky finger is my is my property technically. Doesn't have a large resale value if it's cut off. But, okay, so um, it's property. So what we need to do then is determine exactly what point it ceases to become property and becomes an entity. Obviously, we're not going to have a good logical justification for that because you can't. There's no single principle by which. We can justify deeming the property in the first place, but let's say we're going to go with property, whatever. I don't give a fuck. Um, then we need to distinguish a spot where it ceases to become property, and we need to acknowledge that for a woman to get an abortion, she's going to need the permission of the man who helped her make the baby because the property it belongs to both of them. The fact that it's being kept on her property is irrelevant to the question of whether she can unilaterally destroy it. Yeah, so that's that's I actually agree with that, and and uh, I think a lot of it's not a lot. I mean, this is just anecdote. But if you run into the moral dilemma of, of the of the guy wanting to keep the child, even if the the woman was separated, uh, the, and she has the decision not to, I think obviously you can't uh, force a woman to keep the child. But there is a there is a travesty that's occurring, which is that man is losing his child, and, and well, that I mean, actually happened. I mean, that, actually, that kind of happened to me. So, if in fact, if in fact it's property, then. The woman would be financially liable for destroying his half of the property. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's just because uh, the investment cost is so high, and for us, it's so low. It's I, 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 I don't know how you could ever incorporate that. Um, so it's not property. Yeah, I, I, well, I think just it, it, there's just a, there's a, going to be a a moral. And logistical issue you run into because I think that you and me could say okay. Well, about now this, what you're trying to do is think... shift ground. Now you're trying to shift ground. First, let's no, I'm not. I'm not. Issue. First, on. let's adjudicate the moral issue. Then let's adjudicate the practical issue. Those are separate questions, and the moral issue comes first. Okay, so the and I think the moral issue is the only question that matters because at the end of the day, this has to go out into the public, and it's not all ENTPs that are willing to sit here and deliberate. There are going to be people that are going to be quite. Uh, passionate about whatever decision, and they're not going to play. They, they're not going to be fence setters like us. Okay. Well, and, so, uh, so what about my then pragmatic solution that we we reject the illogic of the Supreme Court's justification and return the matter to the states? I th I think that would be fair. Um, I I think I think just for consist logical consistency, there's been far too much federalization of power over time. So I think for sure, uh, especially towards the executive, but also the you know, the, with the Supreme Court as well, um, essentially when they pass rulings, it can essentially enforce, you know, law across all states, which is not how it's supposed to work. Well, actually, Samuel, uh, let me let me interject here. First of all, let me state uh, this segue is nice to do. But one of my one of the advantages of me being president is that I have a core strategy going in to use the Justice Department to impact case law, which is the more meaningful way to impact the way legislation plays out in the country than actually trying to interface with the legislature per se. But second, I would point out that the incorporation of rights from the Bill of Rights to the states is, um, I, I would call it, I would call it incorrect to assume that was an example of judicial overreach for a number of reasons, uh, because some of those things reflect what even the Founding Fathers would have considered fundamental human rights. Okay. I was about to die. Um, what what platform are you going to be running on? Again? Oh, oh sorry. What, what 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 position are you going to be running for? You mean you mean what party? Well, yes. Um, I don't. I don't. I'm not sure. Uh. It's been recommended to me that I run as a Republican, and the, the logic for it being the following, that um, I'm more likely to influence uh, the more intellectual left to vote Republican for me, because I'm fundamentally nonpartisan, than I am to vote to influence the less intellectual right to vote for me. Uh, if I run as a Democrat, 
the, the right thing. <laughs> yeah. But the thing is, I don't know if that's an accurate analysis or not. The point is, I'd like to run as a Whig. Oh. The Tories and the Whigs. Um, I, mean, I think not? so. Here, here's my my view on on the future of. I, I don't know for the as with as much accuracy. I'm not going to speak about what I what my, may or may not occur as much with the Democrat Party because I think it's it's a younger the younger generation guides it so much more. It's hard. It's a little bit harder to predict. You know, they're out there TikTok and 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 doing silly dances. So we don't know what's going on. But with the Republicans, um, there is an aging demographic, and I don't think that you're going to get that. There is going to reach a critical point where there's they're going to have to draw people from the other side. They're going to have to they're going to have to um, <coughs> move towards the middle. Um, and I think you have a lot of people that are young that would be otherwise disincentivized to go just based on the on the kind of the bad name. Um, I think I mean, that's just I think been, that's a valid counter argument. I think you may well, be right. I think also so my, my the the final part of that too is to that uh, I, I think that the you're gonna have to get a more libertarian shift. Everyone's annoyed by libertarians, um, but I think that's the only way to socialize or not socialize, but move towards a more social middle that would allow... I mean, here's the thing. My, my fundamental point work. is I'm not going to fall victim to that. In other words, I'm not going to be agenda-based in any way, shape, or form. I'm going to be merit-based regarding the specific policies. To the extent that people can put me into a box, they're probably most likely to misplace me in the box called libertarians. The last thing I want to do is to highlight those aspects of myself because that's the box I'm most likely to be misplaced into. The reality is yeah. I am a uh, meta-rational pragmatist, which means I'm not subject to any of the constraints or limitations that would cause people to become wrong in the position of president. Uh, that doesn't mean I'm not incapable of being wrong or anything. It means that I will take every countermeasure uh, to make sure that I'm not. To the extent that those things are effective, then I will avoid being wrong. To the extent that they're not, I will be wrong. But, um, you know, the uh, that's, that sort of meta-rational pragmatism is unboxable by any conventional political box, but I do understand that people need to feel as though they understand somewhat what box I fit into in order to want to vote for me. You're saying libertarian is the best choice of the boxes, maybe. No. no. That's not what I'm saying. I think that what I'm saying is I think the I, I was just making a prediction for the Republican Party and that it's going to have to shift towards a more libertarian uh, middle and it's going to have to shift a little bit more left at least on the social issues over time because they're just they're just at a critical point in terms of, of voter retention. I know that the right has more turnout, but the demographic that is turning out in high percentages is just lower. And so I, I think given the past four years of, of Trump, also it looks like the lo the youngest demographic is gonna skew, you know, very much left. They hate Trump. Yeah, well I mean there, there's the TikTok no generation that, hates Trump. There's no disputing there's, that, that the, the Republican Party is current incarnation is as divisive as it's ever been and as um, it's, it's committed at this point as wholeheartedly as it can to uh, appealing, appealing to the base at the expense of, of reasoned All values. people. You know, at the expense of any, of any support from reasoned people. But the thing is um, you might be right about your analysis here. Uh, and I'm not exactly sure how to deal with the party issue because I really don't want to identify with any major party and yet I seriously doubt uh, whether a uh, third party it may it may be time for a third party candidate to win. I'm not sure. Uh, I, I don't. Th I don't think it's possible. So uh, here's the issue. I think we're doomed. The country's doomed to fail at some point. I think that the democracy as we currently know it's doomed to fail. And I think the reason for that is is polarization has increased over time, um, and then you get alleviations of tension. But there's no alleviation of of Samuel, tension through. As your future president, I'm going to interrupt you and tell you something. You were right until you met me. And then now you have new data. You can change those opinions. I am here to change that. I'm here to change okay. the way this country and the entire world talks about politics. I'm here to way, change the way we think about it, the way we approach it. I'm here to stop the childish bickering and take a professional approach towards the matter of governance. I think you would... I, I, I don't know. I, I, I like the... I like the answer. I just think you maybe there's some 
overestimation of a uh, so little of the data, average person. so much intuition. Well, no, yeah, the average person is kind of dumb. I mean, like, uh, yeah, I'm not I'm talking saying about that... the average person. I'm talking about you, Samuel. Oh, I'm done. No, I just said so much data, so so much intuition, so little data. So, but you you like the intuition? No, I'm suggesting it's misguided, misapplied here. That in fact, mm -hmm. the doubts that you have that are natural and normal because you're hearing something that seems like an outrageous claim. I that, think I will. That no, your I initial don't... intuition is misleading you, and that you'd be well served to look a little further into my uh, political videos, my specifically the ones that cover specific political issues. That's fair. And that you'd see, uh, I've got a lot more viability as a candidate than anybody who meets me in person hears me say that ever dreams by a hundredfold at least. And you've just had nothing on these chancel chancels. On these channels to uh to get yourself canceled no no pussy grabs no no none no, of that i mean you've been clean i'm clean as a whistle in life which is to say i am fully transparent and now that doesn't mean i don't i don't have my own past things that have happened but i've never lied about them or hidden them at all i make no secret of anything that's the obama method i like that when he when he you know i do a little bit of coke everyone does some coke yeah. Right. Well, um, I mean, the thing is, my, yeah. and it all plays into my whole narrative in general, which is, <laughs> this is a citizen democracy, and it is time for a citizen, an actual informed citizen, a particularly well-informed citizen, particularly well-positioned to actually lead the country as a statesman, not as a politician, to come in and say, hey, let's stop with the bullshit, and let's return the citizen democracy to the control of the citizenry. And here I am. I'm a regular person like everybody else, and yet unbelievably, shockingly, and undeniably qualified. And the thing is, if I can be heard enough, I can get enough, 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 a large enough platform that I can get my voice heard and get myself covered by national media or something, then it's game over. Unlike Yang or Kanye West or any of these other bullshit candidates. Or Don't Tulsi, talk shit about Kanye. Or Tulsi Gabbard or whatever her name is. As soon, as soon as I get a little bit of attention from the national media, you will never hear me shut up again. I will seek every interview I can possibly get. I can talk about this shit all day, every day, forever. Unlike these other people, I want a campaign. Why don't you just start political radio? So here's 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 the thing. I, I, I agree. With I you, need to be but... president. It's my duty to be president for Christ's fucking sakes. Look at what you look at the approach you're taking. You're looking okay, at the approach so... you're taking. Pessimism. Wait. The democracy is doomed. That's called Wait. that's called failure complex. No. No, I think, well, yes, yes and no, and yes and no, and no and yes. Um, I think that you are, I, I have, I've come to similar conclusions where like, yeah, this is stupid. There's just bullshit. Why don't we just, we need somebody to go in there like an ax man and just, you know, like Trump said he would do, I'm going to clean out the swamp. And then he just moves in all of his cronies. There's somebody that goes in and just like, is like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, go. And then you just kind of clean up the nonsense. Like, what are you saying? No, you are all going to get in this room and you're all going to, you know, legislate or whatever, right? You, you, you I'm clean not the saying system. that. I, I'm saying I've got to work around to avoid having to do that kind of shit that never works. I've actually thought about systems that would work a lot better too. Um, I have them written somewhere in my notes. I don't, I wouldn't recall off the top of my head, but I think there needs to be a restructuring of the. I'm a step ahead of, of you. Event. You see, you're saying you're, well, you're, blah, you're blah, 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 several blah, years ahead. Okay? You're several years ahead of me too. So but this is what I'm saying have... about, about shit tons of intuition, very little data. All right, that's the ENTP's fundamental Achilles heel. No, right. it's 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 girls that make you feel warm fuzzies, and then they break up with you, and you still feel the warm fuzzies. So I mean, that's, FI that's... abusers. Um, FI abusers are uh, are um, you know they're drawn to our FI weakness like a, a tiger to a fat injured deer. Yeah, I'm just a delicious meat. Okay. Yeah, all right. Let's wrap this up. Thanks for being here. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. The the one thing I want to add, I I I like your ideas. I want to explain the the just the 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 doubt, and that's just that people in large numbers, uh, they want to be part of the tribe. Like you're requiring people to be individualistic, and I think inherently people are not. And I think I think that just 
I just think that it's always going to skew towards some sort of a collectivist downfall. Um, of, all or so, people, so, of all people in the world, I am the one who's able to, most, a, most, most qualified to communicate to each various vector that people are receptive to, including communitarian vectors, without sacrificing fundamental principles. I can explain how I can frame things properly. Here's the, here's the, look at COVID. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're being very moral, and I have the same thing. Like, just get the right people. Like, just do the things right, right? It's simple. It's simple, right? You, you, you bring in a large number of people or whatever, but I understand what you're saying. I understand that you could be the problem solver. I get that. I would, but the thing I'm saying is that there's there's people that inherently don't want problems solved, and there's that that are on the higher ends, and then there's the people themselves are the, also the big obstacle because because misinformation. Because that's the thing I always saw in 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 academia and in science is that that in, people very readily follow misinformation. They're very easily misled. And then there's, there's also the doubters, the people who unnecessarily and repeatedly doubt and express concerns and reasons why I'm going to fail, which, of course, if I were susceptible to, I would not be qualified to be a presidential candidate. Fortunately, I'm both not susceptible to it and have exactly the right response to it. At no point have I... Have I doubted your skills? In fact, I've I've praised them. I and your potential. Oh, I, the equivocation. No, I. I it's what oh, I. What, no. what I. So the the thing that I see that that I think is that is scary here is is just I think we're just a kind of um, we're a very limited species. We have a limited ability to, to, to as a whole, operate in this kind of, um, uh, I, I don't know, the utopian way. And, and, and I think a lot of that is based off of the stories I always heard as a kid and a lot of the, the information I've collected and gathered. And that's just because, you know. Would you agree I'm, with I'm, the following definition of faith, that it's belief in the absence of uh, evidence or in the face of contrary evidence? Yes. Then what I'm telling you right now is the smart, smartest thing you could do is to have faith in me. Can I send you bitcoins? Bitcoins? As an investment? Yeah, know. like how, if I send you one bitcoin, how many bitcoins am I going to get back? Oh, once bitcoins. You yeah, bitcoins. Or Litecoin, Monero, anything? Um, actually, I can, now, I can now receive crypto coin because PayPal receives crypto coin now. I've never received any before. Um, but uh, if you send me a Bitcoin, yeah, I mean, the thing is, I will put it in my presidential uh, campaign fund, which it has currently, I think, $60 in it. I haven't, okay, officially, well, not... I haven't officially started my campaign, and I won't until after the inauguration. I've announced that I will officially begin it shortly after the inauguration. That's respectful of Biden. That's, that's good. Um, uh, the one Bitcoin's worth like 19000 right now, so I'll send you some fraction of that. Okay, I, I don't know much about crypto coin. I know my friend, I have a friend who got rich off that shit, but I don't. he yeah. told me too at back in the day, but it sounded too hard, you know, it sounded too complicated. Mm -hmm. So that's what you get for being a lazy ass ENTP, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but if you committed to it, then you would have done it better than everyone else. Yeah, well, commitment. <laughs> There's that old C word again. Yeah. All right, uh, that was great. I enjoyed talking with you a lot, and um, I think both those videos are going to be good. Uh, I might have to edit out the Mendy's Club out of that one because I don't want to get profanityed too much by YouTube. Oh, I swear a lot too. I'll I swear it's fine, but the thing is, when you start talking about sexual topics, like we, like in that video with the Mendy video, then that's when they start getting fussy. If you swear, we haven't sworn too much. This is this is a fine video. I can tell now. I, can, I have a good sense of it. Anyway, I'm going to end it now. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to eat plenty of cheese.